خلافتنا بنا سور فتية عظيم شأنها بين البرية Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and welcome to another episode of Beacon of Guidance. This is a compilation of questions and answers given by Hazrat Amir al Mu'mineen, Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Israhi al Aziz, from various virtual mulagats from Ahmadis from across the world. Let's now start our program with the very first question. Hazrat Khaliftul Masih V, Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Israhi al Aziz, presided over a virtual mulagat with Waqfinur from America on the 29th of May, 2022. One of the members asked, how can we encourage young Khuddam to join the blessed scheme of Wasiyat? Let's take a look at Hazul's answer. My question is, as a Qayyad and a Waqfino, how do I convince young Khuddam to join the blessed scheme of Wasiyat? You see, you are Qayyad. What does it mean? To serve. Uh, the no. Jamaat. What does Qaid mean? Qaid is the leader. So you are the leader. If your words or your deeds, your actions are the same, then the people will follow you. They will try to listen to you. If they see that you are their sympathizer, they will come close to you. Whatever you are saying, they will hear it and they will try to follow it. So, the first thing is that you form yourself. Be like a person who is following the true teaching of Islam and the Quran. And secondly, Make your fellow Khudam realize that whatever you are saying, you practice it. And then let them realize that you are their true sympathizer. Right? So let them realize that you want them to always remain on the right path. So when these things are being portrayed by you, then other Khudam will follow you. They will listen to you. And uh, you can also explain to them, this Vasiya scheme is a very blessed scheme. If we join this scheme, Allah Ta'ala will also help us and uh, give us the opportunity to reform ourselves. Although it so happens that sometimes some people do see it, but they are not very pious and they go astray. When such things happen to them, or if these are the examples, then Allah Ta'ala also makes the circumstances in such a way that uh, the person either leaves this blessed scheme of Wasiyat or in some other way, he is expelled from that scheme. But mostly, if a person joins the scheme of Wasiyat and he is a true follower, he has read the book of Al Wasiyat, then they will realize that uh, what their duties are and how should they behave. And being a Bakfino, this is your utmost duty to be the example for others. So, okay. you are the people who have promised to reform the world. You are the people whose parents promised and then later on you yourself promised that you will change the world and bring whole of the mankind under the fold of Islam and Ahmadiyyat and make them realize their duties they owe to Allah Ta'ala and to fellow human beings. So, if you are doing all these things, then there will be power in your words. 
and even without saying something, your actions will attract other people to follow you. Okay? For our second question, beloved Hazur graced a virtual mulaqat with Lajna Imaila from Sweden on the 21st of November 2021. Has always asked regarding a new EU law that an employer can fire an employee who wears the hijab. Let's see Hazul's response. Sir Kompazor, my question is that the European Union has passed a new law that says that an employer can fire a hijab employee who wears a hijab employee. So Hazul, do you have any advice for us? What are the guidelines? The thing is that we are also raising the law against it. ठीक है और ये तो ह्यूमन राइट्स के खिलाफ है एक शख्स हिजाब लेता है वो कहता है मेरे इस मजहब का हिस्सा या कल को वो यहूदियों को कहेंगे तुमने वो जो टोपी पहनते हो छोटी सी सर पे रखते हो वो सर पे रख के नहीं आ सकते ठीक है मर्दों को कहेंगे तुम टोपी नहीं पहन सकते या जो सिख जो हैं उनको कहेंगे तुम पगड़ी नहीं बांध सकते तो जो उनके राइट्स हैं उन, उनको तुम डिनाई कर रहे हो तो इसलिए कानून ही गलत है आप ये ऐद करती हैं मैं दीन को दुनिया पे मुकदम रखूँगी ठीक है अगर कहीं ऐसी जगह नहीं फिर नौकरी मिलती जहाँ जो हिजाब की इजाज़त नहीं है इसके बगैर हिजाब उतारे बगैर नौकरी नहीं मिलती तो आप उस नौकरी को छोड़ दें इंसान को चाहिए कि दीन को दुनिया में मुकदम रखे ये ऐद किया है ना हर दफ़ा ऐद दोहराती हैं अपने अजलासों में तो फिर ये ऐद है और उसके खिलाफ लीगल फाइट भी करनी चाहिए और शोर भी मचाना चाहिए लॉबिंग भी करनी चाहिए कानून जो बनाए हुए हैं इंसानों के पार्लियामेंटों में कोई शरीयत के कानून तो नहीं जो हमेशा कायम रहेंगे इसके खिलाफ आवाज़ें उठेंगी एक वक्त आएगा जब भी कानून ख़त्म हो जाएंगे कई इनके अपने कानून बनाए हुए हैं जो ऐसा ऐसा ख़त्म हो रहे हैं तो हमारा भी काम है कि आवाज़ उठाते रहें आज नहीं तो पाँच साल बाद दस साल बाद या अगली नस्ल को कम अज़ कम आज़ादी मिल सकती है लेकिन एक बुनियादी बात हमें याद रखनी चाहिए कि हमने दीन को दुनिया पे मुकदम रखना है ठीक है और जो ये कर रहे हैं वो गलत कर रहे हैं तो और फिर ये एक तरफ कहते हैं ह्यूमन राइट्स की बातें करते हैं दूसरी तरफ जो राइट हैं औरतों के इस्लाम के उसको डिनाई कर रहे हैं हैं तो इसके खिलाफ लिखो अखबारों में अहमदी लड़कियों को चाहिए ना कि लिखें अपने स्वीटिश अखबारों में भी लिखें यूरोपियन अखबारों में भी लिखें जहाँ जहाँ जिसकी जिसकी से है मैंने कहा भी वह काम करें तो आप लोग भी काम करें स्वीडन में लिखें कि ह्यूमन राइट्स के तो वायलेशन तो आप लोग खुद करते हैं ऐसे कानून पास करके एक पोटेंशियल शख्स है एक बड़ा अच्छा कैलिबर का शख्स है एक अच्छी साइंटिस्ट औरत है एक अच्छी डॉक्टर है सर्जन है लेकिन उसको उसका एम्प्लॉयर सिर्फ इसलिए फायर कर देता है कि जी तुम हिजाब पहनती हो तो ये कुछ इंसाफ तो नहीं है ये तो उस पोटेंशियल को वेस्ट करने का है और एक अच्छे दिमाग को उसके राइट से महरूम करने का सवाल है ठीक है तो इस पर खिलाफ लिखें लॉबी करें शोर में चाहो यहाँ शोर में चाहने से बड़ा कुछ हो जाता है तुम लोग भी लिखो ठीक है For our third question, we turn to Germany. Hazrat Khalifatul Masih V, Ayyadahullah Ta'ala bin Israhil Aziz, granted a virtual mulaqat with Atfalul Ahmadiyya Germany on the 28th of August 2021. A child asked that when we face a difficulty, how do we know if it's a punishment or a trial from Allah? My question is that when we are in trouble, how do we know if Allah is giving us a punishment or a punishment? If you are in trouble, if you have done something bad, and that bad is being done in the trouble, then it's obvious that it's being done in the trouble. If there's no bad, then there's no bad. और एक रूटीन वैसे अलबाज मुश्किल खड़ी हो गई रस्ते में सामने आ गई तकलीफ़ें तो फिर इसका मतलब ये है कि कोई अल्लाह ताला के जैसे इम्तहान है ठीक है नबी तो अल्लाह ताला के बहुत प्यारे होते हैं ना उनको भी इब्तला आते हैं मुश्किल आती हैं ना ठीक है वो भी बीमार भी होते हैं उनको मुश्किल भी आती हैं आ हज़रत सल्लम तो सबसे भी ज़्यादा प्यारे थे ना अल्लाह ताला के उनको भी मुश्किल रास्ते में आती थी ना उनके वक्त उनके पास भी ऐसा वक्त आया ना जब उनके पास खाने को लिए कोई खाना नहीं होता था 
जब जंग के दिनों में उनको भी वक्त ऐसा वक्त आया जब उन्होंने पेट पे पत्थर बांधे हुए थे बांधे हुए थे ना तो उससे ज़्यादा प्यारा अल्लाह ताला को कौन था उनको भी मुश्किल में डाल दिया फिर जंग की मुश्किल हुई कई कई दिन की फाके होते थे ताइशा कहती हैं हमारे घर में कई कई दिन आग नहीं जलती थी तुम्हारे घर एक लोग एक वक्त तुम्हें खाना ना मिले तो मुश्किल कहते हो हम किस मुश्किल में फंस गए यही मुश्किल होती हैं कई कई दिन आग नहीं जलती थी कभी खाना आ जाता था और सिरके में डुबो के आंदर सल वसलम रोटी खाते थे तो कहते कैसे कितना अच्छा अल्लाह खाना है कभी किसी के साबी को पता लगा कि कई दिन से आन सल फाक से हैं तो उनको दावत करते थे ले जाते थे अगर तुम्हें तुम्हारे लिए यही मुश्किल है ना कि अगर तुम्हें आज अम्मा पैसे ना दे अबा पैसे ना दे बर्गर खाने के लिए पॉकेट मनी ना दे स्कूल जाने के लिए तुम कहते किस मुश्किल में पड़ गए हम तुम्हारे लिए तो यही मुश्किल हैं या बुखार में मुबतला हो गए तो कहते मुश्किल में आंसर ने फरमाया कि बड़े सख्त गर्म थे कि मैं जितना मुझे तेज़ बुखार होता है और बीमार में होता हूँ जितनी मुश्किल में होता हूँ अगर तुम लोगों को हो तो तुम बर्दाश्त नहीं कर सकते ठीक है तो मुश्किल जो हैं अगर अल्लाह ताला की खातिर इंसान बर्दाश्त करता है नेकियाँ कर रहा है और कोई बुराई नहीं कर रहा अगर तुम समझते हो तुमने कोई बुराई नहीं की तुम नेकी करने वाले हो तुम नमाजें पढ़ने वाले हो अल्लाह ताली की इबादत का हक अदा करने वाले हो लोगों के हक अदा करने वाले हो किसी से लड़ाई नहीं करते झगड़ा नहीं करते किसी का हक नहीं मारते फिर रस्ते में जो मुश्किल आती हैं इतला आते हैं वो इम्तहान है अल्लाह ताली की तरफ से अल्लाह ताली से मज़ीद देखता है कि हाँ तुम बर्दाश्त कर सकते हो कि नहीं और जब बर्दाश्त करते हो और फिर भी अल्लाह का शुक्र अदा करते हो हैं और फिर भी यही कहते हो कि हम राज़ी हैं उसी में जिसमें अल्लाह ताली की रज़ा है तो फिर अल्लाह ताली इनाम देता है और इनाम से नवाजता चला जाता है और कुछ के नतीजे में फिर इंसान को पता लग जाता है कि उस मुश्किल के बाद जब आसानियाँ पैदा होती हैं तो तब पता लग जाता है कि अल्लाह ताला हमारे से इम्तहान ले रहा था लेकिन अगर उस मुश्किल में मुंह से तुम लोग ऐसे अल्फाज निकालने शुरू कर दो जिससे ना शुक्री के अल्फाज हों या शिकवा हो अल्लाह ताला से तो फिर वह मुश्किल लंबी होती चली जाती हैं और वो हो सकता है वो इब्तलाज इम्तहान जो है वो तुम्हारे लिए सज़ा का बायस बन जाए अगर तुम शुक्रगुजारी नहीं कर रहे इसलिए हर हाल में शुक्रगुज़ारी करो अल्लाह की इबादत करो बंदों के हक अदा करो तो अल्लाह ताला उसके नतीजे में रिवार्ड देता है और जजा देता है इनाम देता है और फिर इंसान को पता लग जाता है कि मैं जिस मुश्किल में से गुजर रहा था वो मुश्किल मेरी सजा नहीं थी बल्कि अल्लाह ताला के दर से इम्तहान था ठीक है ठीक है ना Question four was presented to Hazrat Amir al-Mu'minin on the 26th of September 2021 when he granted a virtual mulaqat with Lajna students from Nigeria. One of the students had asked what is Hazul's advice for married couples. With the increase in divorce rate in our society, what is the holiness advice for married couples? You have to increase your tolerance threshold. boys and girls both you see you cannot say the divorce rate is increasing only because of the fault of uh, one person boy or the girl both have some shortcomings in them the best way to live a good married life is that that increase your tolerance level right and ignore all the shortcomings you see in your spouse man should ignore woman should also ignore and try to find out the good things we cannot say that a person has only bad qualities you have good qualities and bad qualities both men also have good qualities women also have good qualities men also have shortcomings women also have some shortcomings so if you realize this fact and understand it that we have to ignore the shortcomings of each other then the divorce rate will reduce and you will live a very happy married life now your responsibility is to bring up your children in a peaceful manner to so give your children the atmosphere which is good for them which can be helpful for their growth and that can only be given if 
husband and wife are living amicably and living a happy life. For the fifth question of this segment, Hazrat Khalifatul Masih the fifth Ayyadahullah Ta'ala bin Esra Aziz blessed a virtual mulaqat with members of Majlis Khudam al Ahmadiyya UK on the 11th of September 2021. One of the members asked Azul, why does the Holy Quran refer to those who have martyred as living? Another Khadim asked why the Holy Quran refers to those who have been martyred as living. They have died in the cause of Allah. And uh, in Allah Ta'ala's eyes, they, are, they will remain alive forever. And they will be rewarded for that in the heavens. And if Shohda also, because they have died for the cause of Allah's religion, Allah's cause, Allah Ta'ala also in this world even, they are liked and they are praised and even people pray for them, for their higher status. So you always remember them. So and their memories are always cherished by their, not only by their family, but by other people as well. So this is why Allah Ta'ala says they are alive, they will be rewarded because dead is that person who is unknown. And after death, nobody knows about him, apart from their own close relatives. But for the Shahada, their name is always remembered. And even they will be rewarded in the heaven more than any other person. Right? See? Yeah. This is why Allah Ta'ala says, don't think they are dead. You think they are dead. They are dead in this world, but they are living a good life in the heaven. And that is your ultimate destination. We now start the second segment of this program. In this segment, we take a look at questions and answers which have been taken from an article in Al Hakam called Answers to Everyday Issues. For our first letter, someone wrote to Hazrat Amir al Mu'mineen, Ayyadahullah Ta'ala bin Asr al Aziz, that some non Ahmadi scholars argue that the phrase, Hubbul Watan min al Iman, or love for one's country, is part of faith, which is attributed to the Holy Prophet, وسلم, was in fact not uttered by him, and they asked for a reference. They further wrote, I tried to find a reference but wasn't able to find any. What should I say to such non Ahmadi scholars? In a letter dated 14th of April 2021, Hazul provided the following reply to the question. This hadith of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, has been narrated in various books. For example, Allama Mullah Ali Al Qari has recorded it in his book Al Mawdu'at Al Kabir. Hafiz Shams Al Din Abi Al Khair, Muhammad Ibn Abd Al Rahman Al Sakhawi has mentioned it in his book. Al Makasid Al Hasana fi Bayani Kathiran Al Makasad Al Hasana fi Bayani Kathiran Min Al Min Al Ahadith Al Mushtahira Min Al Ahadith Al Mushtahira Allah Al Al Sina and Alama Jalal Al Din Al Suyuti has included it in his book Al Durar Al Muntahira fi Al Ahadith Al Mushtahira. Some of the classical scholars have rejected this hadith of the Holy Prophet, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, on futile grounds and through peculiar arguments, instead attributing it to some of the Islamic predecessors, Salaf. However, all of this critique and reasoning by those scholars is invalid in light of the other hadith and in view of the teachings laid out in the Holy Quran. Therefore, one cannot deny that this hadith is a saying of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, merely on the basis of the views of these scholars. They argue that there was no connection between one's love for their country and one's love for their faith, since disbelievers and hypocrites also love their country, despite not having even an ounce of faith. They ask, how could one's love for one's country be part of faith? This argument of the classical scholars is not acceptable because there are several ahadith of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, in the authentic books of hadith, the subject matter of which is equally applicable to Muslims as well as disbelievers and hypocrites, just like the subject matter of the aforementioned hadith. In Sahih Bukhari, for instance, the following hadith has been recorded. Hazrat Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu narrates that the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, None of you can be a true believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. Sahih Bukhari, 
کتاب الامان سملرلی حضرت عبداللہ بن عمر رضی اللہ عنہ نریٹس ونس اللہ مسنجا پیس اینڈ بلیسنگ اللہ بی اپن ہم پاسٹ بائی این اینڈ ساری مین ہو از ایڈمانشنگ ہز بردر اگینسٹ ماڈسٹی ہیا اپن دیٹ اللہ مسنجا پیس اینڈ بلیسنگ اللہ بی اپن ہم سیڈ لیو ہم فار ہیا از اے پارٹ آف فیتھ Now the question arises whether liking for one's brother what one likes for himself or adopting the attribute of Hayya is only for believers and disbelievers or hypocrites cannot acquire these morals. That is, if a disbeliever or a hypocrite likes for his brother what he likes for himself or if a disbeliever or a hypocrite inculcates Hayya, can it be said on this basis that because these morals are also adopted by disbelievers and hypocrites, hence these ahadith cannot, God forbid, be the sayings of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Moreover, in the Holy Quran and the Ahadith, there is great emphasis on the fulfillment of covenants, and it has been considered a good attribute. Now, if a disbeliever or hypocrite fulfills his pledge or covenant, will we be right in saying that the act of fulfilling one's covenant was not a Quranic command or the saying of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, considering that even disbelievers or hypocrites abide by it? Therefore, we shall certainly not accept that this hadith were the most insightful and wise words of Hubbul Watana min al-Iman was not the saying of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, merely on this premise of the classical scholars. These are certainly the blessed words uttered by the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, which are recorded in the above-mentioned books. I have listed below the full references from these books for your knowledge. المقاصد الحسنة في بيان كثير من الأحاديث المشتهرة على الألسنة كتاب الإيمان by the critic and historian by the critic and historian الإمام الحفيز شمس الدين أبي الخير محمد ابن عبد الرحمن السخاوي death 902 A.H. الدرار 2 الدرار المنتهرة في الأحاديث المشتهرة The Letter Ha Part 1 Page 9 By علماء جلال الدين السيوتي Died 911 A.H. Dated 911 A.H. 3 الموضوع الموضوعات الكبير أردو بزار كراتي قرآن محال Pages 193 to 197 By ملا علي الكاري Dated 1014 A.H. For the second letter, someone wrote to Hazrat Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ayyadahullah Ta'ala bin Asrah al-Aziz, and asked whether Muslims believed that the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, the two cities of Lot's people, were burnt down as a punishment for their sins of adultery and homosexuality, etc. He asked whether this was supported by the Holy Qur'an. In his letter dated the 26th of April 2021, Hazul replied as follows. The Holy Quran does not say anywhere the Hazrat Lot, peace be upon him's people, were burned. Rather, this is a biblical statement. Hence the Bible states, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire, from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities, and all the plain, and all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Genesis Chapter 19, verses 24 to 27, KJV 1611. Similarly, it states, And that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt, and burning, that is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 23, KJV 1611. Thus, according to the Bible, Those people were burned and turned into sulfur and salt. On the other hand, according to the statement of the Holy Quran, Allah the Exalted punished them for their transgressions, including harassing prophets in various ways, abusing them verbally, rejecting them, threatening to expel them from their lands, looking at the prophets' companions with disdain, robbing wayfarers, mistreating neighbors and guests extremely badly, harassing vulnerable people, and committing fornication and homosexuality, etc. As a punishment for these sins, they were destroyed by an earthquake in such a way that their settlements were turned upside down and gravel rained down upon them. And the people of the city came to Lot rejoicing, thinking that they now had a good opportunity to seize him. Upon this he said to them, 
These are my guests, so put me not to shame by threatening them. And fear Allah and disgrace me not. They said, Did we not forbid thee to entertain all sorts of people? He said, These are my daughters, among you who are guarantee enough, if you must do something against me. O our Prophet, by thy life, these enemies of yours too, in their mad intoxication, are wandering in distraction like them. Then the promised punishment seized them, the people of Lot, at sunrise. We turned their town upside down, and we rained upon them stones of clay. Surah al hijr Chapter 15, verses 68 to 75. Hazrat Muslim Maud explained the wisdom behind the punishment and elaborated on the reign of pebbles mentioned in this verse as follows. Because the people of Lot, peace be upon him, abandoned high morals and replaced them with lowly morals, in a similar manner, God turned the highest parts of the city into the lowest, and in a manner of speaking said to them, Go forth thence, live in the lowest part. Some people wonder how stones rained upon them. The answer to that is that a severe earthquake may sometimes cause parts of the land to rise and then fall. That is also what happened then. The ground, which was rocky, rose and then dropped down, causing them to be crushed under the rocks. It may also mean that the walls of their houses fell down upon them, since it is said that they used to build their houses out of stones. Stones that are mixed with mud are also called sijil. This term accurately describes walls that are made of rocks and mud. Tafsir Kabir Urdu Volume 4, page 99. While explaining the rain of stones in another place, Hazur, may Allah have mercy on him, says, It was actually a shower of rocks, which was the result of a terrible earthquake. That is, the surface of the earth was overturned and the soil went up hundreds of feet, and it was as if soil and rocks rained down upon them. Tafsir Kabir, Urdu, Volume 7, page 408. The people of Lot rejected the messengers. When their brother Lot said to them, Will you not become righteous? Surely I am unto you a messenger, faithful to my trust. So fear Allah and obey me. And I ask of you no reward for it. My reward is only with the Lord of the worlds. Do you of all peoples approach males? And leave your wives whom your Lord has created for you? Nay, not only do you commit this act, but the truth is that you are a people who transgress against the dictates of human nature in every way. They say, If thou doest not, O Lot, thou wilt surely be one of the banished ones. He said, Certainly I hate your practice. My Lord, save me and my family from what they do. So he saved him and his family, all of them, save an old woman among those who stayed behind. Then, after having saved Lot, we destroyed the others. And we rained upon them a rain of stones, and evil was the rain of those who were warned by God, but did not desist. Surah al shuara Chapter 26, verses 161 to 174. Moreover, Surah Al-A'raf, Surah Al-Tawbah, Surah Hud, Surah Al-Naml, Surah Al-Ankabut, Surah Qaf, and Surah Al-Kamar also mention the sins of this nation and the divine punishment that befell them. Therefore, a study of all these Quranic verses proves that this nation was destroyed by an earthquake and a storm of mud and stones as a punishment for their sins. They were not burned by fire. For our third letter, someone wrote to Hazrat Amirul Mu'mineen, Ayyadahullah Ta'ala bin Asrah al Aziz, stating that water did not reach the skin of the part of the body that had been tattooed. He then asked for guidance regarding the validity of wudu or ghusl for someone who had a tattoo on their body. In his letter dated the 16th of May 2021, Hazul provided the following guidance on this issue. Firstly, it is not permissible to tattoo someone or to get a tattoo anyway. This prohibition has also been mentioned in a hadith, where it states that Allah the Exalted had cursed those women who, for cosmetic or aesthetic purposes, practiced tattooing and those who got themselves tattooed, who altered Allah's creation. Sahih Bukhari, Kitab al Libas. When the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, was commissioned as a prophet, on the one hand, the poison of various kinds of polytheism had spread everywhere in the world, and especially in the Arabian Peninsula, and on the other hand, different kinds of misguided attitudes had also gripped humanity in their claws. Men and women were involved in various kinds of polytheistic rituals and social evils. They included polytheistic practices such as having the image of a goddess, idol or animal tattooed on the body, face or arms to seek blessings, 
or it was done for cosmetic or aesthetic purposes to then promote social misconduct and obscenity. It is not forbidden for a person to adopt any legitimate methods for their own beauty, while remaining within the permissible limits. The attainment of beauty about which the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, warned of God's curse, means something else. And the wisdom behind the prohibition of some of those means appears to be that there is a fear that this kind of action may lead to an inclination towards shirk, which is the gravest of sins. Or if these things are carried out in order to beguile the opposite sex in an impermissible manner, then all those means would also be considered unlawful and actionable. As far as getting a tattoo is concerned, whether it is a man or a woman, the only purpose behind it is to show it off or to beguile the opposite sex in an impermissible manner. That is why people usually get tattoos on body parts that they may then expose and exhibit to the public. However, if a person gets a tattoo on a body part which is commanded to be veiled, sutr, then first of all, at the time of having that tattoo, the individual violates the commandments of parda and commits obscenity which is against the teaching of Islam. Moreover, one idea behind getting tattoos on the veiled parts of the body is that they may be exposed in front of the opposite sex while committing evil deeds. All of these methods are prohibited because they contradict Islamic teachings. Furthermore, tattoos have also been linked to a host of physical and health issues. For instance, the sweat glands under the skin are badly affected in the areas of the body that have tattoos. That is, having a tattoo reduces the sweating in the concerned parts of the body, which is harmful to one's health. Similarly, since tattoos become permanent features on the skin, sometimes as the body grows or shrinks, so does the shape of the tattoo, which makes a tattoo look ugly instead of beautiful. Then, such individuals begin to think of them as a plague that they cannot get rid of. Thus, for these reasons alone, it is futile and absurd to get a tattoo. Therefore, it is not permissible for a believing man or a believing woman to get a tattoo on their body. However, if a person has had a tattoo on their body before becoming an Ahmadi, and now Allah the Exalted has given them the ability to accept Ahmadiyyat by showing them the true path of Islam, then this act would fall under the category of accept what has already passed. Moreover, such a tattoo from prior to accepting Islam would not affect the validity of one's wudu or ghusl. Just as a woman's applying nail polish does not affect her wudu and her wudu is valid even though she has applied nail polish. In the same manner, such a person's wudu and ghusl with tattoos would be valid. And that concludes another episode of Beacon of Guidance. Join us next time for more questions and answers with our beloved Hazur, Ayyadahullah Ta'ala bin Asrahil Aziz. Until then, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuhu.